The talk I deliver at the auto meeting is really focused on a number of these new advances in a couple of different realms. And of course, there's so many different ways to think about new advances with, within the field of melanoma, new drugs, new ways of thinking about our existing drugs. So the way I, I choose to think about how the field of melanoma is moving forward is to put different topics in a few different buckets. So the first bucket I think that we learned in 2020 about the treatment of advanced melanoma, and advanced melanoma I mean stage three unresectable melanoma or stage four melanoma, is information about combination of olimab plus ipilimumab combined checkpoint blockade. And that we, we learned a few new aspects of this combination. We've already known we have five-year overall survival data for this particular combination. But I think what was new in 2020 is we learned a lot more about the role that this combination may play in the setting of stage four completely surgically resected melanoma or completely irradiated melanoma. And the results of the ImmuNed study led by Dirk Schadendorf and colleagues really told us about the power of checkpoint blockade in this patient population that we had not previously explored this combination. And this is surgically completely resected or radiated stage four melanoma. The results of that study showed that either nivolumab alone or the combination of nivolumab plus ipilimumab really impressively improves recurrence-free survival compared to placebo observation in these patients. And so should be considered in patients with surgically resected stage four melanoma, either PD-1 alone or the combination of both ipilimumab plus nivolumab. And I think the other interesting aspect of that study that we learned is that even the patients that received the combination, they only had a median of two doses of treatment with the combination. And many of us know that the intent to treat is always with four doses of the combination. But this really, along with prior retrospective data, really supports the notion that you may not need a lot of combination immune checkpoint blockade to get a really beneficial long-term outcome, whether it's in stage four resected melanoma or even in unresectable melanoma. We've seen patients that stop combination checkpoint blockade due to toxicity can do quite well long-term, and it's not really clear that more treatment is necessarily better in some of these patients. So one of the other advances in 2020, I think, is a study that we led from Sloan Kettering here, where instead of dosing combination checkpoint blockade until toxicity, we would dose only based upon the efficacy that we were seeing. So we gave patients, instead of four doses of combination checkpoint blockade, we gave them two doses of checkpoint blockade. And we found that after the second dose of treatment, if we were to get a CT scan and see what was going on in these patients, Two thirds of them are already having a good treatment effect, meaning no more tumor growth and many of them have shrinkage of their tumors. And what we did in that study is we transitioned patients directly to the wall map maintenance if they were already having a good result after two doses of combination checkpoint blockade. And with this approach in general, the objective response rate and best overall response rate over the duration of the follow-up, which was nearly two years, was 57%, which is a best overall response rate that would be seen in older studies of the combination where patients were to receive up to four doses of the combination. So it really gives more information along with the ImmuNed study that we may not need all four doses of the combination. My recommendation to practitioners is not necessarily to shorten the course for all patients because we don't have large enough data sets to say that. But if you've given two doses of checkpoint blockade in the combination, patients are having some toxicities, it may be worth getting a CT scan, seeing what's going on with the tumors. And if indeed those tumors are already shrinking, perhaps just transitioning to single agent PD-1 at that juncture after the patients are feeling well. So those are some of the learnings that we've had in terms of combination checkpoint blockade. There are some additional learnings we learned in 2020 on the combination in that we hadn't really established in a very robust way how well the combination works in settings of PD-1 refractory melanoma. And in 2020, there are more data that were presented mostly at the ASCO 2020 meeting, both retrospective and some prospective data that ipilimumab in combination either with pembrolizumab in one study or a retrospective study led by the Australian group, whether ipilimumab plus nivolumab compares favorably to ipilimumab alone retrospectively in patients with unresectable melanoma who have progressed on PD-1. Both of these studies show approximately a 27 to 31 percent response rate for the combination in settings of PD-1 refractory melanoma. And I think this is impressive because this is a group of patients 
if they don't have a BRF mutation and they've been treated with PD-1 monotherapies already, there aren't many great options in this situation. So to have a high 20 or low 30% objective response rate in this population of patients is quite impressive. And I think a benchmark for which other new agents moving into the PD-1 refractory space will need to ultimately surmount to show really promising efficacy. So that is some, those are some information about the combination that we learned from 2020 in the melanoma field. In addition to that particular combination, there's other combinations that we've been very, very interested in in melanoma. And one of them has been the possibility of combining BRAF plus MEK plus immunotherapy. So the idea of taking a BRAF mutant patient and instead of just giving them BRAF and MEK inhibitors, adding a PD-1 or PD-L1 immunotherapy on top of that to see if you can combine the best of the targeted inhibition against the BRF mutation with immune therapy as well. And prior studies unfortunately showed that combining ipilimumab with BRF and MEK inhibitors was a little bit toxic from a side effect perspective, but there's been a lot of enthusiasm in combining PD-1 and PD-L1 inhibitors together. So with this in mind, there were two phase three studies of triplets that read out in 2020 in the melanoma field. One was a study testing vemurafenib plus cobimetinib plus or minus atezolizumab, which is a PD-L1 inhibitor, which differs from pembrolizumab and nivolumab, which are PD-1 inhibitors and already approved in melanoma. But this study demonstrated that when atezolizumab is added to cobimetinib and vemurafenib in this phase three context in a randomized study, it improved the investigator-assessed progression-free survival. So this was a positive phase three study, and in the United States led to regulatory approval for the triplet combination of emuraf and a plus cobimetin and plus atezolizumab. And we're still, of course, waiting on more robust and mature overall survival of this approach. We still don't really know if it's better to do triplet therapy for which patients. Should we use certain biomarkers? Should there be a selection criteria for these patients? Or should we still think about giving either immunotherapy alone or BRF MAC inhibition alone and then follow that with immune therapy upon progression? We don't have that kind of sequence data, which is really critical to fully understand where this triplet will come into play. But it is important that we did have one big phase three study that was positive in support of a progression-free survival benefit for atezolizumab in combination with vemurafenib and cobimetinib. Now, unfortunately, enthusiasm for this triplet approach has been a little bit mixed. There was another phase three study in melanoma in 2020 that read out called the COMBI-I study, which tested dabrafenib plus trametinib plus or minus a PD-1 inhibitor called spartalizumab. And unfortunately, this study was statistically negative for an improvement in progression-free survival. So it showed that adding spartalizumab, that PD-1 inhibitor, to BRAF and MEK inhibition with dabrafenib and trametinib, unfortunately, was not successful in terms of improving progression-free survival. So I think the jury's still out on triplet therapy, which patients will be used, which patients are not appropriate for it. I don't think it will be something that will be uh, taken up by everybody, of course, with the BRAF mutation. And we still are waiting on data on BRAF MEK inhibition versus immune therapy alone. And that information will hopefully further clarify where the role of triplet therapy may ultimately lie. The last quick advance I'll talk about for 2020 in melanoma is about treatment with new drugs and new approaches. And I think the two ones that I wanted to highlight, number one is tumor infiltrating lymphocyte therapy. And this is an old treatment that's been developed for many, many years uh, in the National Cancer Institute and many institutions around the world. But I think right now it's really meeting prime time success. And there have been data with TIL therapy in PD-1 refractory melanoma, I think that are very, very exciting. And in brief, TIL therapy is when a patient has a tumor removed surgically, then the lymphocytes are harvested from the tumor, treated in a laboratory to expand, and then reinfused back into a patient following chemotherapy and with administration of interleukin-2, and so that the T cells proliferate. And the idea is that the T cells that were removed from the tumor at the time of surgery and treated in the lab are good melanoma fighting cells and that those will fight and destroy the melanoma tumors that the patients still have in their body. And the results are pretty good in PD-1 refractory melanoma with over a 30% response rate, which again is in that really great category for this PD-1 refractory melanoma context. So our hope is high that we will see good efficacy of this approach, but it is quite a complicated approach and needs to be done in specialized centers of expertise because this is a difficult treatment to administer, particularly the interleukin-2 component of it. 
So I raised that as an example of some new ways that we're doing new treatments in melanoma. There's another study that came out recently combining lenvatinib with pembrolizumab, and lenvatinib is a drug that inhibits angiogenesis, and that showed also some really promising results in PD-1 refractory melanoma. So we don't have randomized data yet in these kinds of contexts, but I think we have a couple of interesting leads for PD-1 refractory melanoma, and hopefully we'll see more and more efficacy as the patient populations increase. So quite an interesting year in 2020 for advanced melanoma. Some mixed news with some of the phase three studies, especially with the triplets for BRF mutant melanoma. But I think we are still pushing the envelope forward, coming up with new targets, and it's, it's exciting to see what 2021 will bring.